top 10 American sports coupes of the 90s. I had fun doing research for this video as I didn't even know some of these cars existed. A lot of the cars on this list are heavily slept on and forgotten about. Like when was the last time you saw a Chevy Lumina Z34? If there's a car on this list that you forgot about or never heard of, then be sure to like and subscribe as it motivates me to continue making these videos. If you are new here, I upload weekly every Tuesday and at the end of every video, I make a tier list of all the cars mentioned. This is where things get heated though as it's 100% opinion based. With all that said, let's jump right into it. Eagle Talon TSI. Eagle is a weird brand of its own, so to have a performance oriented car is strange. Now this one-off Chrysler branch was to compete with GM's Saturn line. I couldn't tell you who sold more cars. What I can tell you is the Eagle Talon TSI is a heavily slept on car. The Talon and Eclipse were pretty much the same. Same transmission, same engine, and same drivetrain. Really what sets them apart is just the cosmetic looks on the outside. The TSI came with a 5-speed manual and had the 2-liter 4G63 engine from Mitsubishi. 210 horsepower and 205 pound-feet of torque. Not bad at all. Regular TSIs came with front-wheel drive, but there was the optional all-wheel drive package. The new Talon TSI Turbo with all-wheel drive. It smokes signals. The Eagle Talon failed mainly because the Eclipse stole the spotlight. For the last year of the Talon, the Eclipse sold nearly four times as much. It just never became a known name like the Firebird or Mustang. And in 1997, only 10,000 units sold. My girlfriend's dad had one of these puppies back in the 90s, and to this day, he still thinks it was one of the best cars he's ever owned. Geostorm GSI. Again, another failed attempt to compete with the imports. There are entire videos about this goofy brand. I don't really want to get in depth with it. The Geostorm was a rebadged version of the second gen Isuzu Impulse. And I believe Geo as a brand was manufactured entirely by Isuzu, just sold in the States as Geo. The intended purpose of the Storm GSI was to be a budget car, with the look and feel of a sports car. However, for whatever reason, the Storm didn't come with the Impulse's Lotus tuned suspension, nor with its all-wheel drive system. Nevertheless, it ended up selling better, and these cars sold like hotcakes. Later models came equipped with a 1.8 liter four-cylinder rated at 140 horsepower made it into a five speed manual zero to 60 in around 7.1 seconds i'm sure one of you watching had one of these things or knew someone that did Geo was super popular back then but nowadays finding one is super rare toyota and honda were the last word in the world of sporty imports but that was just the calm before the storm introducing the all-new storm gsi the 16 valve performance force from geo Getting to know you. See your Chevrolet Geo dealer and get to know Geo Storm. Mercury Topaz XR5. The Topaz was Mercury's version of the tried and true Ford Tempo, which replaced the Ford Fairmont. When researching this car, I found it strange that Lincoln didn't have their own version of this car. Ford back then would add a little chrome to everything and call it a Lincoln, but I guess not for this car. The XR5 was the top of the line sports trim for the two door coupe. And while the Topaz name lasted until 1994, this special XR5 trim would run until 1992. The XR5 came equipped with the Vulcan V6 from the Taurus and Sable at the time, 130 horsepower and 150 pound feet of torque isn't all that great for a car of this size, 0 to 60 in around 8 seconds. However, the transmission was taken from a Taurus SHO, which was a 5 speed manual. The XR5 trim came with additional body cladding, fog lights, bucket seats, and a sportier gauge cluster. These cars are super rare. Mercury only sold 464 models. To me though, I find this car pretty interesting and I never knew this car even existed. Chevy Beretta Z26. When the Beretta first came out in 1987, it was a big deal for GM. It marked the return of a two-door compact car for Chevy. If you're familiar with the Beretta name, then you would know that it's an Italian gun company. And crazy enough, they sued GM for $250 million. Thankfully, this didn't go through and they settled on an agreement. If GM lost, I don't think they would have recovered. 1994 would be the first year of the Z26 trim, which replaced the GT and GTZ from prior years. The Beretta was a size in between the Cavalier Z24 
and the Lumina Z34. It's crazy to think that GM had three performance oriented family cars in the 90s. They just don't do it like this anymore. Under the hood, we are greeted with a 3.1 liter V6 that produces 160 horsepower. Nothing crazy, and if you got the Beretta Z26 in the final two years, then you got five less horsepower because GM had to meet emission regulations. I don't believe GM marketed this car as like a speed demon. Rather, it offered high content at an affordable price. Seeing one of these things in mint condition is super rare. These cars are road hard and put away wet. Pontiac Sunfire GT. GM saw the public eye turn to front wheel drive imports, so they decided to make a brand new platform, which will be later known as the J platform, and they would use it from 1981 all the way until 2005. The Sunfire replaced the pretty reputable Pontiac Sunbird, and while the Sunbird was a decent car, it wasn't meeting safety standards. The GT model was the top notch sporty trim for the Sunbird. GT models have dual exhaust, 16 inch alloys, and came with flashy body panels. And no, there wasn't just cosmetic stuff added. The GT models got a beefy 2.4 liter twin cam 4 banger, which produced 150 horsepower and 150 pound feet of torque. I needed a reliable set of wheels. I wanted something hot. So I got a Sunfire. I mean, I shopped around. Neon, Civic, boring, and Escort. Are you kidding? All you've got to do is look at the Sunfire. Base models had barely 100 horsepower, so this new engine was nice. The Sunfire was an affordable commuter that achieved excellent fuel economy. Nothing really to write home about, but still deserves a spot on this list. Plymouth Laser RS Turbo. Remember the Eagle Talon? Well, this was Plymouth's version of it. The Eagle Talon discussed prior was the second generation for this platform. Due to poor sales numbers, the Laser only made it to the first generation. Still, in my opinion, it deserves a spot on this list. Plymouth is hardly ever mentioned, and for that, I wanted to give them some attention. Attention. The Laser was the most performance oriented in Plymouth since the Barracuda and Roadrunner in the 70s. Rally sports models or RS are set apart from base models with a few notable features. Power steering, cosmetic accents, dual power mirrors, and a more powerful engine. Two liter turbocharged four cylinder that puts out 195 horsepower made it into a five speed manual. That sounds pretty good to me. And if you got a 92 or later model RS, it came standard with all wheel drive. Chrysler marketed Eagle as the more performance brand and Plymouth has more of the value oriented mainstream brand. And for that, the Laser was looked over. The Eclipse did the best, then the Talon, then the Laser. And in 1994, they stopped production mid-year, which is crazy, I've never seen that. Beautiful. Thank you. Your, your Plymouth Laser RS Turbo. You can talk. That's not all. <laughs> Zero to 60, 6.4. You like all wheel drive? Well, I Beautiful. Don't try this at home. No. Plymouth Laser, an intelligent machine. Can we go for a spin? Sure. Chevy Lumina Z34. GM was widely criticized by the press for being late to the aero design game. And by that, I mean in 1986, Ford introduced the all new Taurus, which ended up being the car of the year. Well, this was GM's response. The Lumina replaced the Chevy Celebrity and Monte Carlo and used the GM10 platform, which is shared with the Grand Prix, Cutlass Supreme, and Buick Regal. The Z34 was the sportiest package for the Lumina. And if you remember earlier, we talked about the Beretta Z26. This is its big brother. And now I'm not gonna put the Cavalier Z24 on this List, I feel like the Sunfire GT is pretty much the same thing. It came standard with FE3 sports tuned suspension, a 3.4 liter V6 that puts out 210 horsepower, a 5 speed manual, dual exhaust, and 4 wheel anti lock brakes. In 1993, Chevy sold over 200,000 units of the regular sedan compared to 12,000 units of the Z34. Mercury Capri XR2, another car I had no idea existed. The Mazda Miata took off in the States, and Ford saw this opportunity and wanted to join in. They also made this car because because Ford wanted to bring down the average age of Mercury's buyers, which was like 60 years old at the time. The XR2 models, which again, was the top notch trim, were equipped with a 1.6 liter turbocharged four cylinder that put out 132 horsepower and 136 pound feet of torque, all made it into a five speed manual. And yeah, these ended up selling poorly compared to the Miata and MR2. They were slow with bad handling. I mean, they do have pop-up headlights, which is definitely a cool feature, but in terms of everything else, the Miata was just so much better at the time. Ford Probe, and this is the second generation. Speaking of Mazda, this was one of those partnership kind of deals Ford had with them back in the 90s. In terms of this build, 60% was from Mazda and 40% was from Ford. Mazda created the engine, transmission, and chassis, while Ford engineered the body and interior. The Ford Probe 
probe succeeded the Ford EXP and weirdly enough, Ford intended this car to be the fourth generation Mustang. They thought this because one, the probe was very popular and liked among enthusiasts, and two, front wheel drive platform was super cheap to make. Obviously this made fans very mad. No rear wheel drive and no V8 in a Mustang is crazy. In 1994, Ford released a limited edition GT Plus package, better known as the Wild Orchid edition. This package had special badging, different wheels, and most notable was the paint job. It had this bright, beautiful purple color. I just find it so unique and they just don't do this type of stuff anymore. In 1993, Ford managed to sell over 120,000 units, but in 1997, that number went down to 17,000. Ford proposed a third generation using the same platform as the Contour, but obviously this fell through. And actually the new design they came out with became the next generation Mercury Cougar. Oldsmobile Achieva SC. Oldsmobile was trying to get out of its funk, rebranding their motto as not your father's Oldsmobile. And with that, they needed a sports coupe. The Achieva used the same platform as the Buick Skylark in Grand Am. And while different, the Graham Am outsold it by a lot. The SC X-Trim, which is like the top of the line, was offered for a limited time. 190 horsepower from a four cylinder, which was very impressive in the 90s. Actually, this was GM's highest output from a naturally aspirated four banger. Personally, I like the looks of this car. I think it's very different from anything out there. However, the Achieva name came to an end pretty quickly with the Alero taking over its place in 1999. It is now time for the tier list. In F tier, we have the Mercury Capri XR2. In D tier, we have the Pontiac Sunfire GT. In C tier, we have the Plymouth Laser RS, Lumina Z34, Beretta Z26, Geostorm GSI, and Mercury Topaz XR5. In B tier, we have the Oldsmobile Achieva SCX, Ford Probe GT, and Eagle Talon TSI. I like making these 90s cars video as it helps me learn more, but if you guys don't like it, then let me know in the comments down below. And with that, I will see you guys next week.